start a new quarter today. We're starting in the Book of Judges. Thought it was kind of about to do two quarters in a row and we'd be with the Book of Judges in uh, the quarter. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I, do, uh, I do like doing a book like this that uh, I normally don't like to do historical books, but it helps me dig in and it helps me to learn more and study the scriptures more, so I do appreciate that opportunity. We are starting off in Judges. Um, today, really, I want to talk about what got us to this point. So we looked last uh, quarter in the New Testament, but the quarter before that, that kind of prepared us for this, and went through the book of Joshua. Um, so I want to spend most of the day today really just talking about what led up to where we're at in the book of Judges, um, and then kind of read through the first chapter of Judges and really dive into it next week. Um, so starting out, um, for me, I... I have a tendency, and as I'm looking at uh, Bible verses or lessons in the Bible, to not be able to place things on the timeline very well. So I want to kind of walk through the timeline this morning, um, looking at the years and the sequence of events that got us there, just to kind of help you line things up in your mind, um, kind of help, help make it clear for me as well. The first thing we start out, um, and the, the dates that I have, the years that I have, may not be exact, depending on where you look to get dates there. They differ from a, a few years, but I picked one and went with it. So starting in about 2081 B.C., God made his covenant with Abraham uh, in the book of Genesis. So what was God's covenant with Abraham? God made a covenant with Abraham um, that he would bless him, he would bless his uh, descendants, he would make them large nations, and he would give them this land that's currently a foreign land to them. They don't, um, they don't own, somebody else owns and inhabits that land. My Bible won't mind my head. So we'll read through that account in Genesis chapter 17. Um, God's covenant with Abraham. That's really where all of this begins um, and the reason that we got to the point where we're at. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. For an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout the generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be, shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who bought money from any foreigner who is not, your descendant, who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall be surely circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from my people, or from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah will be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be mother of nation, a mother of nations. 
kings of people will come from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his, for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you with this season and year. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all the servants who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and the circumcised flesh of their forced men in the very same day, as God had said to them. Now Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his forced men, and Ishmael, his son, was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his forced men. In the very same day, Abraham was circumcised, and Ishmael, his son, all the day, all the men of his household who were born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. So God establishes his covenant with Abraham, and he makes a promise to Abraham that he says he's going to keep, and he goes ahead and tells him that it's going to be the land of Canaan. He tells him the promises in the land of Canaan. Uh, he tells him it's going to be he's going to be the father of many nations. Um, and so as we walk through, we we see God promise the birth of a son, Isaac. So we know that that happens. Isaac is born um, somewhere around 2066 BC. And we see about 12 years later what happens to Isaac. His firstborn, uh, well, not firstborn, this uh, son of Abraham that God promised to bless with many nations. What happens about 12 years later? It kind of makes Abraham question everything. That's when I found it to give. So Abraham's told to sacrifice Isaac. So Abraham goes all the way up to the altar. Um, we know that story. And he gets all the way up there and he's about to sacrifice Isaac. He's about to kill this child that God's promised to bless him and bless these nations through him. Um, so that test of faith for Abraham, Abraham is going to go through with it. And God stops him and, and provides a goat as a sacrifice. Um, so about 50 years later, we've got Isaac has children. He's got the birth of Jacob and Esau. So we know the story of Jacob and Esau, um, where Jacob is the younger brother. Esau is all this. He's the firstborn. He's got the birthright. Um, but Jacob deceives him. Jacob and his mother deceive Esau and Isaac. Um, so somewhere between that time and about 1991 B.C., Abraham dies at the age of 175. So we're about 1990 B.C. And then 1978 B.C. is when uh, the incident occurs with Jacob and Esau, where Jacob goes out, or Esau comes in for the day, and he's so hungry, he's famished, he wants to eat, and Jacob, Jacob basically tricks him into uh, selling his birthright or giving away his birthright to Jacob. And his father is not aware of this at the time, you know that. Um, so it's not for a long time. And I didn't realize it was this long, so I was studying. Do you know how long it was until Jacob actually gets Isaac's blessing from when, from when he tricked uh, Esau in giving away his birthright? How many years is that? Then we have in about 1906 BC, um, 
I'm sorry, before that, 1915. So after Jacob has many children with Leah, he's finally able to conceive a child with Rachel. And so Joseph is born. Um, and then a few years later, 1906 BC, Jacob finally receives a blessing. He kind of got the blessing from Isaac, but in 1906 BC, or right around there, um, is when he receives the blessing from God. And so God talks to Jacob and he tells him um, it will be called Israel. And he promises the same covenant that he promised to Abraham to fulfill that through Jacob and his lineage. Um, about 1898 BC, so we're um, about 200 years after God's covenant with Abraham, is when Jacob's son, Joseph, is sold into slavery at the age of 17. Um, in 1886, about 12 years later, Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of Egypt, and seven years of plenty begins. 1875 BC, Jacob and his family come back to Egypt um, during the famine. Um, this is about 33 years after Joseph disappeared when his brother sold him into slavery. And then about 70 years go by, um, Joseph eventually dies, Jacob's family, Israel's family, stays in Egypt, and the Israelites begin to multiply in number over the next one or two hundred years. The Israelites uh, grow so large that eventually, somewhere around 1600 BC, the Egyptians decide that they were coming too large in number. And so they have a king that comes and says, we can't do this. If they continue to grow this way, they're going to outnumber us. And they're going to be able to, if they wanted to do anything in war, they would have the numbers to beat us in war. So Egypt, at that time, somewhere around 1600 BC, puts the Israelites into slavery. They make them work for them um, just because they have too many people. So about 75 years goes by where the Egyptians are in slavery. Um, they're working, I'm sorry, the Israelites are enslaved to the Egyptians. And in about 1525 BC, we see the birth of Moses. Um, so we know Moses came, um, but it was a, not for about 35 more years um, that Moses flees out to Midian. And then he comes back in 1446. So he's born in 1525, 1446. Um, the Israelites are groaning, they're complaining about being uh, enslaved. And so Moses comes back and is sent to deliver God's people from the hand of the king. And so that's when the Exodus begins. And so we begin through the book of the Exodus. 1445 BC, so one year after they are released from slavery. They've been in slavery for over 100 years. Less than one year later, the Israelites are complaining. Um, they won't need to eat. So they got food, but they won't need to eat. So they're complaining. Um, so we see right off the bat, uh, the Israelites are not grateful and not on the, on the journey with Moses because they thought it was going to be a quick escape to the promised land. Um, so then we have, in 1407, um, we know that they traveled through the wilderness. We did that about this time last year. We studied through numbers, I believe. So they go through the promised land, and it's been 37, 38 years. Um, Moses has been faithful. Moses is ready to go see the promised land, and what happens? When Moses is not allowed to see the promised land, what does he do? fails to give God credit for the water coming from the rock at Meribah. So after 37, 38 years, they've traveled through the wilderness. Um, they have depended on God for food. God's rained down food from heaven. He's given them quail. He's provided water when they need water as they're walking through this wilderness. Um, so for 38 years, Moses has been faithful to God, and he's put up with these Israelites complaining, um, always complaining to Moses. They're always looking at Moses say, why are, why are we here? Why did God put us here just to come to this wilderness? Um, you know, we thought we were going to the promised land. We might as well have just stayed in Egypt and worked for them. We would have had it better there. 
So Moses finally gets mad, um, probably not realizing that he's really only about a year or two away from seeing the promised land. So Moses finally gets mad. Why is it such a big deal that Moses didn't give God the credit when he hit the rock and walked the water came out of the rock? It seems like a simple thing. I've always thought of that when we look at that story. It seems like such a simple thing that he hit the rock, the water came flowing out, but he didn't give God the credit. Why is it such a big deal? So he takes the credit for himself. He says that he and Aaron, that we have to provide you water. Um, but if you look at the history of the Israelites, if you look at their journey through the, through the wilderness, we see time and time again that they turn against God. They challenge God. Um, they build idols when Moses goes up on the mountain. Um, they continually turn away from God, and Moses kind of has to bring them back on track. So up until that point, 38 years, Moses has continued to do that. They straight away and he brings them right back on track. And so at this time, they're back to the same point where they were when they wanted to meet. They're complaining, they're hungry, they've been traveling for nearly 40 years, out in the wilderness. Um, they're ready to get to the promised land. And so now Moses, instead of getting them back on track by showing how God provides, he takes credit for that. So that hurts the faith of the Israelites. Um, it's a bigger deal, I think, because of not just because of what he did, but because of the impact it had on the people that were looking to him um, to provide that example to lead them in the way of the Lord. So uh, shortly after that, Moses dies. Um, who does God put in place? To continue to lead the Israelites to the promised land. Joshua. So we went through that last two quarters ago. God appoints Joshua, commissions Joshua. The Israelites do make it across the Jordan and make it over on dry ground, just as they made it across the Red Sea when they left Egypt. They made it across the Jordan on dry, dry ground. They go in and with Joshua, they conquer Jericho, they conquer Ai. In about 1399 BC, so we're looking at 600 years probably, um, since the promise of Abraham, we have the Israelites finally getting to the point to where the land's getting allocated to their tribe. They're finally starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. They've had this long journey, um, they've made it through the wilderness, they've conquered the initial uh, people to get into the land. And they're starting to divide this land up. However, that land is still inhabited. So we know that they can't just go into the land and take it for their own. There are still people living there. And so that's a lot of what we're going to look through this quarter if we look at the judges. Um, there's a lot of war, a lot of fighting. The Israelites still have to drive out and conquer those lands so that they can take over the land of Canaan. About 1375 BC is when Joshua uh, gives his farewell address. He reminds the Israelites that God has given them everything that he promised. And I did want to read that. That was kind of the end of our study in Joshua. We'll look at Joshua 23, 15 through 16. come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you. So the Lord will bring upon you all the, all the threats until he has destroyed you from off his good land, this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. So before Joshua dies, he gives this warning to the Israelites. He says, you people have strayed. Look, you've served idols before. Remember where God has brought you. Remember where you've come from. We're finally here. Hold firm to the faith. Stick with it. Um, hold up our end of the covenant so that God will hold up his end of the covenant as well. <laughs> So after Moses died, God appointed Joshua to lead the 
Israelite, after Joshua died, he was appointed to lead the Israelites. No chance. Why is no one appointed to lead them? They really need a leader at this point. Think about where they're at. So Moses came and Moses led them out of Israel, so they needed a leader to get them from, sorry, led them out of Egypt. They needed a leader to get them out of Egypt, um, across the, the Red Sea, across the wilderness. They needed somebody that was there to continue to keep them on track throughout their time. And then they still haven't made it there when Moses died, so God appointed Joshua as the leader to get them there to the land. So now they're here at the land. They've divided the land up amongst the tribes, um, and they're about to go out and conquer those lands. So really, they're dividing up into tribes. So to me, it kind of logically makes sense at this point that really the leaders of each of those tribes are, are the leaders going forward, and there's not really a single leader needed at this point. Um, that's just my thought, my take on it, on those different thoughts of why. After Joshua, God didn't appoint um, someone to take his place to be the head of the entire Israelite nation. Um, but at that point, they weren't necessarily a kingdom. They didn't have a kingdom yet. They were still moving in to this new place. And so they didn't need a king because they didn't have a kingdom. They really just needed leaders to go into battle and um, take over their land. You might have any other thoughts on that? Of why? After Joshua, we don't have an appointed leader. It may have been to give them a, the opportunity to choose God as their leader. Or to set up what I already knew was going to happen. And they had already predicted what happened. That they would pull the deoxidation to wherever the inhabitants were. But it may have been just. Part of God's plan is to let them see and let them choose. I think it had leaders. I don't think it had one particular appointed leader because God <coughs> communicated with somebody. He didn't communicate with the whole nation of Israel at one time. He had to communicate with somebody. But they were leaders. Of each tribe, let's say. Wow. Okay. So now we're coming into the book of Judges, um, after Joshua dies, we're about 700 years after God's promise to Abraham. Um, so 700 years, think about that timeline. 700 years from when God promised it, and God's promise is being fulfilled uh, as the Israelites go into Canaan and start taking over, taking over those lands. So we'll look now at Judges chapter 1. The book only goes through a portion of it. I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter um, because we don't go into the rest of the chapter next week. Starting in Judges 1, read the entire chapter. Now it came about after the death of Joshua. The sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given this land into his hand. Then Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted me, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated ten thousand men at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek and fought against him. And they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued and caught up, and, caught, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to gather up the scraps at my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Then the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword, and the city was set on fire. Afterwards, the son of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, living in the hill country, and in the Negev, and in the lowlands. So Judah went against the Canaanites, who lived in Hebron, now the name of the Hebron formerly known as Kirath Arba, and they struck Sheshal, or Sheshai, and Ahiman, and Talmai. Then from there he went against the inhabitants of 
de Beer. Now the name of de Beer formerly was Kerat Sefer. And Caleb said, The one who attacks Kerat Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter for a wife. Othniel, the son of Canaan, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. So he gave him his daughter for a wife. Then it came about when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a bill. Then she, then she alighted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of Nago. Give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. The descendants of Kenai, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms, with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the land south of Arad. And they went to the people. Then Judah went to Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites, living in Zephath, and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. And Judah took Gaza with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. Now the war was with Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had iron chariots. Then they gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had promised, and he drove out there the three sons of Anak. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. But the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Likewise, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. The house of Joseph spied out Bethel. The spies saw a man coming out of the city and said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city, and we will treat you, treat you kindly. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man and all his family free. The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city, and named it Luz, which is its name to this day. But Manasseh did not take possession of Bethshean and its villages, or Tanak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. It came about when, Israelite, when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nekwal. So the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Echo or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Elah or of Ashtia or of Pella, or of Aphek, or of Rehob. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beshima, or the inhabitants of Beth Anon, Anon, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Beth, Beth Shemesh and Beth Anah became forced labor for them. Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the valley. Yet the Amorites persisted in living in Mount Perez, in Ajalon, and Shalvan. But when the power of the house of Joseph grew strong, they became forced labor. The border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim from Selah, upwards. So we'll continue looking at this uh, a little bit next week as we look into Judges 2. I wanted to get into the takeaways from the lesson today. So going all the way back to Abraham, I really had a point in going all the way back through that um, the history um, all the way from Abraham to this. So the point of the lesson today, our takeaway, is that God keeps his promises. So God made a promise to Abraham 700 years before what we're reading about today. God promised Abraham that his, his descendants would have the land of Canaan. 
Um, so we went through kind of the timeline of events of everything that occurred between then and now. Um, it wasn't easy. So it wasn't easy for the Israelites. It wasn't uh, a journey that they necessarily would have wanted to do again, going through the wilderness for 40 years, going through battles that they didn't always win, <coughs> they didn't ask for God's help. Um, but God kept his promise that he had made to Abraham 700 years earlier. So what is God's promise to us as Christians today? What does he promise us as followers of Christ? if we will obey him and if we do not promise this destruction as he did it. The promise is much the same. But just as he promised the Israelites, if you do this, then you get this. If you don't, then you get this. So John, as John said, God's promise to us is a promise of eternal life with him. After this earth, we got the promise of eternal life with him. We also have the promise of the Holy Spirit while we're here on this earth. But just as it was for the Israelites in our life, it's not going to be easy. God doesn't promise that it'll be easy. Um, there are preachers out there that will tell us on TV all the time that God wants you to be happy and God wants you to live this wonderful life. And that's just not what we see in God's Word. We see, historically, God's people. Um, the journey to get to where they were going, the journey to get to God's promise, was not easy. Um, and a lot of times, what was the reason? It wasn't necessarily God. Their own stubbornness was because of their own sin. So I think it's the same for us today. A lot of times when things aren't easy, it's a result of our own actions, it's a result of our own sin um, and the things that we're doing. It's, we get it, Genesis chapter 2, it's because of the fellowship we keep, the people we're around, all of Joshua and they were, that they were told you would eliminate those people, eliminate those gods. Testament is all going to be about what, what happened in Judges chapter 2. Right. And we have the same problem. We're hanging around the wrong people, the wrong crowd. We're, we're supposed to be set apart. We don't set ourselves apart. We're setting ourselves up for failure. So we see at the end of the promise that God made, we're not even to the end yet, but we can see just reading through Judges chapter 1 as God's starting to fulfill that promise. They're getting into this land, and they're not driving the people out. And while that might sound like a bad thing at first, it's not necessarily a bad thing because now they've got what? They've got help. They've got people to do the work for them. They've been doing all the work themselves for the last 40 years, 40 plus years, as they've been going through the wilderness. Um, so now they've got people that help do the work for them and help get their community set up. Um, so it's kind of one of those blessings in disguise. So if we look at the, the journey of the Israelites, um, we're able to look back at it and say, well, how did they not do better? You know, how did they not continually follow God? But if you really think about it, um, if you had, even though they had the miracle of manna from heaven, they were still eating the same thing every day. They're still physical human beings just like you and I. So think about it, if you ate the same thing every single day, do you not think you would end up complaining just like they did? So I think we get into the same things today. Um, we just don't have the, the hindsight yet because we're not there. We can't look back on our lives and we're in the middle of living through um, the events that are occurring. And just like the Israelites at the time, their physical human body um, resisted. They wanted to do things. They had temptations that they, they gave into. Um, we have those same temptations. But just as then, we can be assured that that promise that God made for us that he will fulfill if we will keep our end of that covenant. Anybody have any comments before we close? You know, a remote reward sometimes is not very practical, particularly in our day and time. We are free to instant gratification. And uh, it was the same with, with these people. They're, they're working and struggling and thinking about what's going to be best for their uh, children several generations in the future man. and sometimes it's easy to lose sight of the long term Heavenly Father, thank you so much.
so much for your word, God. We thank you. And we have the ability to look back at your word, but we have the ability to study your word at home, Lord, wherever we're at. We thank you for the country that we live in, where we have the freedom to do so. Lord, we, we thank you for documenting these things, God, so that we can learn from your people thousands of years ago. We pray that we will take a lesson from that, God, and that we will continue uh, on our journey as Christians to fight the fight, Lord, and continue to strive to be people that you would have us to be, Lord. Pray that you will be with us as we go into our worship service today. Help us to clear our hearts, clear our